Welcome to Successful Parenting, where we, Jackie Rue and Robin Choquette, share practical skills for families to build resilience and healthy connections. As practicing professionals and parents ourselves, we hope this podcast is a resource for parents to grow, reflect, and learn more about themselves and their children. Our approach is simple, tangible, and most importantly, we lead with compassion for the integrity of the families we serve. This podcast should not be taken as medical advice and is intended for informational purposes only. We love our work and we can't wait to watch families gain confidence and open themselves up to new ways of successful parenting. On today's episode of Successful Parenting, we will talk about how awareness and emotions play such a vital role in our parenting. Hi, Jackie. How are you today? Hey, Robin. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Okay, so awareness. I feel like this is one of those topics that for me as a parent, I really have to check myself. I have to be on top of it. Well, it's so interesting. And and I love, I actually love this topic. And, you know, you and I have raised our our girls together and and we've shared so many of these stories. And I just remember um, in particular when my younger daughter was in middle school, how so often I found myself just reacting and how quickly that would lead to an argument or a fight that later I realized so much of that was really about my lack of awareness. Absolutely. Because we get caught up, right? in it all we get caught up in what's going on and i think being able to reflect being able to think and and that so much goes back to you know the behaviors goes back to our emotions all of that starts playing and gets so intertwined and what we know is that if we can connect in a way that really builds that closeness in the family then the overall you know, well-being of the family, the mental health of the family is so much better if we can have this awareness and connect and just have a closer relationship. And so hopefully in this episode that we're going to be able to touch on some topics that uh, our parents out there are going to be able to find helpful and enjoy. Well, and I think the fun, fun thing about us is we truly have so much fun with the families we work with. And you know, we've had opportunities to work with them in, in so many settings, right? From hospitals to schools um, to counseling agencies. And I'll never forget one of my favorite parents, you know, and Robin, I think I think you were there at that time. You and I were working in the hospital setting for, uh, you know, helping children that really struggled with anxiety and, and school refusal. And I'll never forget, we had this one mom and, and she came in and said, Jackie, Robin, I need your help right away. <laughs> Jackie, Robin. <laughs> Um, And it's so funny because so often, right, when people are feeling in crisis mode, it it really is, you know, everything's terrible. Everything's awful. We need you. Nothing's working. Um, And I remember one of the the things that that really stood out to me is that mom said, you know, I'm just so overwhelmed. My child can't function. My child can't do anything. My child is just so depressed. I can't make my child do anything. And I feel so hopeless. I don't know what to do. And I remember we, we took a step back and, and we separated uh, the child and the the parent for a little bit. And and we, we talked to the parent a little bit about what was going on for them and, and where that was coming from. And it was interesting um, when the child, uh, you know, then later came with us and, and was able to go into some counseling groups and things, even though the child struggled, the child was able to do a really good job of, of managing you know, their emotions. Yeah. And and later we were able to talk to the parent and it was really about the parents fear. My child isn't, isn't okay. That led to that parent's uh, frustration led to that parent's anxiety. And I think so often when we start to view our children as, um, you know, fragile or they can't handle things, we parent out of that. And it, it really does a disservice for our children. Absolutely. I I, I so much agree. And, you know, Jackie, I think one of the things that I love about working with you and our work together is that we don't judge our parents. We, we recognize our own stuff. So as we're talking about this family, you know, Jackie, you know, the story of how I actually led out of my own feelings and my own emotions. So folks, Back a number of years ago, I'm taking my youngest daughter to the airport. She is going to Ireland. She is 
um, there to work studying at the University of Dublin. And the entire time there, I was so proud of her and so excited and really wanted to set her up for success for the whole summer in Ireland. That's not quite what happened, right? (laughs) The entire trip. (laughs) I'm talking about how far away she's going to be. I'm talking about what it's how it's going to be so different. We pull up to O'Hare Airport. She gets out, and this is a kid that doesn't cry a lot. And she totally crumbles crying. And I'm looking at her and I'm thinking, like, what is going on? And she said, that was the worst pep talk mom I've ever had. <laughs> In my entire life, what were you trying to do? And that's when I realized I, you know, my goal was to set her up, but I was totally leading out of what I was experiencing, what was going on in the moment. And I think as parents, you know, we all do that in families. Often we get caught up. And I think that's why, you know, having that awareness is so important. Well, and I think that's a perfect example, Robin. You know, we've talked to so many families in the last couple months, really the last couple of years, and and they just say they have so much fear and so much anxiety about, you know, things going on in the world, about, uh, you know, their child's education and and schooling. And, And so often one of the things that we really lead in when we're running parenting groups or we're running parent uh, talks or presentations, we remind parents that all children struggle. So our job as clinicians, as parents, is not to prevent our children from struggling. And that's what's really unique about Robin and I is, it, you know, I love that we teach, we teach kids how to struggle and how to get comfortable being uncomfortable, but we also teach parents how to kind of take a step back and be comfortable with their children at times not being comfortable. And I love that example because so often we start to really label our children, right? Mm -hmm. You know, when you think about a few words that you would describe your child, you know, I might, when I reflect back with one of my daughters, I remember there was a a period of time where I would have described her as really fragile, uh, anxious. And I remember I found myself coddling her or kind of reassuring her way too much. And really all that did was promote more anxiety for her. So I had to be mindful of my own reactions and managing my own anxiety when I was parenting. And so when we start to talk about, you know, how do you view your child? It's interesting because you might have multiple children in your home and you might, you know, really say, okay, well, this child is more resilient. So you parent that child different. Right. And then you have another child that maybe is more emotional or struggles. And so you may find yourself lowering the expectations or reassuring them more or intervening more. And and what that does is it really can set that child up. And then that child's belief about themselves will be impacted. Yeah, so so true. You know, psychobabble terms, and I always kind of label it like this. So emotional IQ, and and when I talk to parents and families about emotional IQ, I, you know, sometimes they get it, and sometimes they say it just seems like it's a lot of words that I don't quite get. And I always divide it up into two ways. Pretty simple. One is personal com- uh, competence. And there, Jackie, is what exactly what you're saying is having that self-awareness for yourself. And then how do you manage yourself? And that's kind of the first component of emotional IQ, because the better we get that emotional IQ right in the family, higher we can get that picked up. We start to see communication just improve. And on the other side is what's called social competence. And there is where, you know, you want to have the ability to understand what's going on around you, what's happening for others, being able to, you know, in other words, read the room, right? What else is happening here? It's not just what's going on for me. <laughs> <laughs> and then how do you manage those relationships? I, You have the best analogy of this plane and flight attendant. I, I, I want you to tell this story because I laugh every time you tell it. It cracks me up. Well, and I'm going to lead in. I'm going to preface it. One of the things before I tell the story, one of the things, Robin, that you and I do uh, starting usually around this time of year is we work with a lot of uh, kiddos that have anxiety and school refusal. And so one of the things that we do is is we support parents and helping them uh, get their child you know, to go to school, to kind of get in a better routine. Um, and, and where this started is I had a mom I was working with and she had a seven-year-old. 
and we were doing uh, some role plays in the morning and we were, I was kind of driving with the mom uh, while she was taking her child to school. And one of the thing I noticed is the little seven-year-old started to look really anxious in the car. She started to shake and right away, I noticed mom's anxiety really spiking and, and mom all of a sudden started to really start to ask the daughter a lot of questions. Are you okay? Are you going to be okay? You don't yeah. look okay. And I remember the little girl just started to fall apart, kind of like what you said with your daughter. <laughs> And it really struck a chord for me is, is how as parents, we need to be empathetic and compassionate and understanding, but we also sometimes need to have a game face, right? And so the analogy that, that I use so often with parents is if you're on an airplane and all of a sudden there's a lot of turbulence in the airplane, you might notice that you start to feel panic. Well, right away, what most people do is most people will look to the flight attendant and they'll kind of get a gauge of how that flight attendant looks. And if the flight attendant looks really calm, then they start to sense, okay, the situation's okay. And if the flight attendant looks really anxious or panicky and runs around and is asking all the passengers <laughs> if, if they're going to be okay, if they need anything, but in a really panicky voice, right? we laugh because then it really heightens the anxiety and the stress and the panic of the passengers. And so often when we're talking to parents, we talk about starting to settle in and be aware of your own emotions and reactions you know, whether you have a child who you're concerned about making friends, you know, do you find yourself like checking in with the child every five minutes about if they're okay and about friends, or do you take a step back and allow that child to have some space to learn that it's okay to be uncomfortable. It's okay to not feel okay sometimes. And how do we teach them to build that resilience? Yeah. Great examples. I mean, that was exactly this, that emotional IQ that we talked about, that I just talked about. You just gave the great example of the personal competence and then the social. One is my own self-awareness and how do I manage it? And that other side is having the awareness of others and then that relationship management. If I don't want someone to freak out, I need to stay as calm as possible. I worked at Starbucks for um, several years. And one of, I remember another employee said, I like working with you because you don't seem to get frazzled. And I turned and looked at him and, you know, it is so busy at that time in the morning. And I said, I feel like I'm freaking out. And they said, I would never know it. And, and that is it, is that being able to keep yourself calm because I knew if I got frazzled, the person standing next to me on that bar, it would be so hard. And I really checked myself at that time. And it, that's such a great example of it. Well, and I think sometimes for many of us, and, and if you're listening today, um, you know, think about, and I know Robin and I, you know, we've had several conversations about that, you know, think about kind of what are things that trigger our emotional responses in our parenting and sometimes we can even look back to our own experiences with our own childhood. You know, possibly as a child, maybe you felt really alone or, or you felt misunderstood or, or even bullied or you felt that there was a lot of anxiety. Um, some of that might come to play in your emotional reactions with your own children. So often our reactions are rooted in our own fears and insecurities. And so starting to be aware of that. And I know we talk a lot about this in our parenting book, Robin that, you know, what are those triggers we have that cause us to emotionally react? And we're going to be talking about this in future podcasts, but I know for, for me, one of my triggers was when my kids were anything other than okay. You know, when my girls were really sad and disappointed, that triggered an emotional reaction in me that I really had to learn to be aware of. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, our own history and watching our parents. I mean, I grew up in the time where, I mean, my parents loved me and they were engaged, but let's be honest, if I was in a fight with my friend, they had no clue. They, I, I, I they probably cared, but let's be honest that we didn't definitely have a lot of conversations about it. Right. <laughs> um, and I think it looks much differently. As you said, often parents would you know, did you have a fight with a friend? How did it go today with your friend? And and keep leading those questions. And the child starts to get more worried and more anxious about that relationship, right? Versus, it, you know, it, it comes and goes and um, things 
happen in relationships and building those is part of that process and kind of getting through that, those points of difficulties and being uncomfortable and having obstacles. Well, and I think many of our kids will say, um, you know, there, and and one thing we've, we've talked about too, and I've noticed is many of the kiddos we work with uh, struggle with confidence and they struggle with um, just feeling secure in themselves. And so often, you know, what I've learned through my work is that confidence really comes with believing that you can manage difficulty, believing that you can overcome adversity. And so one of the things that we talk about so much is, you know, how, how are we viewing this child? And if you can start to see the child in terms of like their strengths and their weaknesses, as opposed to this child is so anxious or this child is so bright, you know, avoid labeling, you know, even those, even those children that we work with that get labeled as bright so often feel really like anxious that they can't live up to that label. So we try to Mm -hmm. avoid the labels, but I think it, it, it's so helpful to start to be at least for me aware of what my perceptions are. Yeah. And, you know, Jackie, you and I've talked about this and it's in the workbook too, where we're talking about, you know, accurately assessing where your child is and, Often when I'm talking to families, I will have them to to create categories. I start off with the five of one is the cognitive, second was emotional, um, their occupation, which when they're in school, obviously it's school, um, relationships and their communication and their relationships and their own self-care. And we start to look at each of those and where do we have strengths? Where do we struggle? And it can be really fluid. Like for some kids... In certain situations, they seem to struggle a lot more emotionally than others. You know, I'll hear parents say, well, you know, I feel like my child is an old soul. They're really in touch. But then when I point out, well, if we look at the way they're handling this situation, they seem to become very emotional, um, much different than I would expect for a child that age. And parents are able to step back and not get caught up in that it's one or the other, right? That very kind of black and white type of thinking. They start to look at it in this continuum kind of way. And where is my child? How are they managing all of these different areas? And I really like that as a way to start assessing in a more clear way versus kind of how it feels in the moment, how it emotionally may feel when you're thinking about your child. Well, and really the reality is, you know, like I said earlier, all kids struggle, right? And so just because a child's struggling now does not mean they're not going to be successful tomorrow. And and with the pandemic, um, we've seen that there's even been some emotional regression and we've seen that, uh, you know, some children are behind maybe where they typically would have been a couple of years ago. So it's not, it's not, not, it's not necessarily anything to um, catastrophize or really react to, but it is really about you know, being objective and looking at where is my child at and and what are some goals that I have as a parent and are my reaction, you know, like you said, in line with those goals. It's, it really is interesting because I think at the root for most parents, we just want our kids to be okay. But so many parents will say to us, I just want my child to be happy, Mm -hmm. but it really isn't about being happy. It's about being, being okay, feeling all different kinds of things that there are, there are no good or bad feelings, right? right? There's just feelings. And and for all of us, it's hard. And so we can kind of lean in and, and laugh together. We have so many funny uh, parenting stories. And in <laughs> fact, Robin and I were able to to write this book because, right, we've, we've made every mistake in the book, yes. as, as our kids as our kids would say. And yes. so, you know, and, and our kids are a little bit older now, so we can laugh about it. But it really is about embracing the discomfort and allowing your child to have some space, you know, yeah. um, I was working with, with a young uh, boy recently and, and mom said, this boy has a lot of anxiety and can't handle a lot. But when we started to talk about, you know, having expectations for the child, um, and really holding those expectations consistently with, you know, privileges and whatnot, the, the child was able to meet the expectations. And the mom said, wow, I, I can't believe my child is capable of that. And it really did kind of come from that place of when we started to shift our mindset and we started to set realistic expectations for the child, the child was able to really meet them. Right, right. And and grasping that, you know, that emotional state the child is in, it's going to come and go, 
right? There's that beginning, the middle, and the end to that emotional state. And we have to help them by riding the wave out just the way they need to ride that wave. And as you said before, you're absolutely right. It's not good or bad. It's just the wave of the emotion. And that's a great example of, you know, for parents to understand if you ride that wave, the kid rides it right with you. And in, in that, you know, when we're able to recognize how we're helping and maintaining those behaviors, because I think that is part of it. Like we have to have that awareness of what am I doing to influence what's happening? Am, am I continuing to set my child up to believe that they can't handle it if I'm always available to text, if I'm always responding to their texts. Because I remember working with a parent and I said, you keep telling the child that they can handle it, but every time the child struggles, you're there to answer the text, you're there to respond and set that child up so they can't internally figure it out on their own. And I remember the parent saying to me, I just have such a hard time with that. I have a hard time letting that go because I want them to be successful and I know they can. And the part was, is helping the parent to understand what they were responding to was not the child. They were responding to themselves, to what was going on for them. Well, and I think we always encourage parents and, and we can say this as we, you know, kind of wrap this up. We always encourage parents, if you find that you're worrying excessively or you're worrying a lot and, and you're really concerned, um, you know, we often laugh if you find yourself, you know, fighting and power struggling and you feel like it's not getting anywhere, uh, seek out some some support. You know, there's a lot, we work a lot with parents and uh, just helping them with that purposeful, successful parenting but, but seek some support for yourselves. You know, we're all in this together. And I, I truly believe we've all been in that place where we've been worried about our kids when they've been struggling. And, and that's okay. It, it's learning how to navigate that in a way where our children build confidence in themselves and they build that resiliency. Uh, and, and that's really what this is all about, right? Right. Absolutely. And you're, you know, you're right. We all, it's not about did we make a mistake or not? It's just, are we moving towards that goal? Are we thinking about that and, and trying to keep that in our focus and moving there? And this is a place that there is no judgment. Um, Jackie and I will never <laughs> tell you that it's a horrible thing. We'll just say, well, that's interesting. Maybe <laughs> I know. What, okay. So you change back and forth going from the child and kiddo. So, I, the other day I was talking to someone who was in their early twenties and I'm called him a kiddo. At what age do you stop calling him a kiddo? I feel like at my age, they're still kiddos. <laughs> when do you stop Jackie? Uh, cl clearly not. No, <laughs> clearly I haven't stopped, but, um, and by the way, you know, it's, it's funny because a lot of our, our, our kiddos do, they agree with a lot of what we're saying. And so, yeah. you know, if you ask your children, um, they will agree with some of this. But um, I think uh, this is good. I'm looking forward to our next conversation. Yeah, sounds great. Thank you for joining us. And make sure to subscribe and like us to catch our next episode, where we will take you on a journey to find new ways of successful parenting.